promises made but not delivered. After a splinter group of former FARC rebels takes up arms, is President Ivan Duque facing another guerrilla insurgency? I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is Colombia's fragile peace. When one of the key players who helped broker the 2016 peace deal announced on YouTube he was once again taking up arms, President Ivan Duque's reaction was to put a bounty on his head. But does Commandant Marquez speak for all former FARC members? While his group of ex guerrillas who Duque calls narco-terrorists, show no signs of abandoning their cocaine business or the idea of bringing down Colombia's government, FARC's top leadership remains committed to the deal. Not as committed, it seems, is the government, who's been both slow and reluctant to implement most of its conditions. Caught in the middle are thousands of former rebels in the tricky process of reintegrating into society while facing a lack of resources and the threat of targeted killings. Natalie Perhonen has more. Colombia no acepta amenazas de ninguna naturaleza y mucho menos del narcotráfico. Los colombianos debemos tener claridad que no estamos ante el nacimiento de una nueva guerrilla, sino frente a las amenazas criminales de una banda de narcoterroristas que cuenta con el albergue y el apoyo de la dictadura de Nicolás Maduro. Fighting words for a nation that's no stranger to conflict. More than 200,000 people died in the 52-year-long war between the leftist guerrilla group, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, known as FARC, and the government. But in recent years, there's been a fragile peace, brokered in a 2016 accord to end the bloodshed. It's now at risk of crumbling. A group of dissident FARC rebels, including a former commander who negotiated the deal, says it's taking up arms again. It is the continuation of the guerrilla struggle in response to the state's betrayal of the peace agreements in Havana. He's accused the state of failing to uphold its side of the pact, including protection for demobilized guerrillas. About 7,000 former combatants handed over their weapons and agreed to return to civilian life as part of the deal. The majority of them and FARC's political leadership say they're committed to it. Temporary settlements like this one were set up to help ex guerrillas reintegrate into society. There have been many difficulties in this process, but this does not mean that we are going to give up and take up arms again. No, on the contrary, we cannot leave what little we have already built. The health of the deal under President Ivan Duque had already been questioned. He came to power last year on a pledge to change parts of the accord and had support from Colombians who felt the rebels got off too lightly. He's been accused of moving too slowly to implement parts of the deal. It's full of promises that will take years, if not decades, to deliver, like greater development in rural areas affected by the fighting. So delays already at this point in the process are adding to concerns. And the government is still fighting dissident FARC guerrillas. It's estimated there are more than 2,000 fighters, including recruits who've joined after the accord was signed. Bogota accuses Venezuela of providing some of them with shelter. This new threat has shaken Colombia's peace. But was it already in danger before this recent call to arms? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, to answer that question and more, let's go to our guests in Washington, D.C. I'm joined by Peter Hakem. He's the President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Inter-American Dialogue in uh, Bogota. That wasn't Peter Hakem, my apologies. In Bogota, Colombia, Ser Sergio Guzman is uh, also there. He's the Director and Co-Founder of Colombia Risk Analysis, a political risk consultancy. And also in Bogota is Richard McCall, a journalist, writer, and the host of the Colombia Calling Radio Show. I promise we'll have everybody up at the right time in the next few minutes. But gentlemen, let's begin with you, Richard. Is Colombia returning to war based on the available evidence and recent developments? Um, 
In a quick answer, I'm going to say that no, Colombia is not returning to war, but what it, we are presented with is a certain uh, case of dynamics which can create increasing security challenges for Colombia. We have, of course, the, uh, P, the vacuum of power in the regions, which are now controlled by various armed groups, not just the dissidents of the FARC. Uh, we've got the problems in Venezuela. And, of course, there's all sorts of equations that are unique to Colombia because of the economics of the cocaine industry and, indeed, the politics in neighboring Venezuela. But Colombia is not returning to war. Peter Hakem, is Richard right? I think he's got it just right, frankly. The, uh, what we're seeing is armed groups who are uh, obviously interested in uh, getting uh, uh, access to resources, money, etc. Uh, in some cases, it's worthwhile for them to think of themselves as guerrillas. Uh, but by and large, uh, I think a return to the uh, the war that uh, pervaded Colombia for 50 years, there's very little prospect of that. Uh, despite the problems in Venezuela, I, I don't think that that adds a whole lot to the, the right. dangers confronting Colombia on this. So, Sergio Guzman, when we—if Colombians see the news and they hear that in Western Cauca there was a mayoral candidate who was murdered, along with her mother and four others, by dissidents. And on the other hand, we have the government saying they killed nine dissidents in an air raid. Doesn't it sound very much like the peace deal isn't holding when we have these in incidents happen? Well, first of all, let me thank you for, for the invitation and greetings to Peter and Richard. Um, you know, in a way, the peace agreement has always had inherent fragility. Inherent fragility that the state doesn't control rural areas, inherent fragility that there's still illegal economies throughout the country in cocaine trafficking and illegal mining, inherent um, fragility in that rural young men remain unemployed and are being um, recruited by insurgent groups and uh, criminal organizations uh, still. So I think that, in a way, until Colombia doesn't uh, fix those inherent fragilities, uh, real peace is never going to be uh, a reality. But what you mention is closely aligned to the proximity of an electoral moment, which we have local elections on 27 October. Right. Richard McCall, if we look at these fragilities, who's most to blame for the fragile situation then? Well, we can say, of course, that the government has its fair share of, of blame. It's been strangling the uh, commitments that were supposed to be made, of course, when the peace accord was signed. There's been a lack of money and a lack of will. But, of course, President Duque ran on, uh, on this basis of tearing the peace accord to shreds, which he hasn't, but at the same time, uh, that, that was his policy. But the FARC as well, the dissident FARC, and of course, these uh, two high ranking FARC members, uh, Jesus Santric and Ivan Marquez, are very much to blame as well. And it seems like there was an internal struggle very much in the FARC itself between the leader, Rodrigo uh, Londoño, and Ivan Marquez. So we, we're seeing that both sides harbor some of the, the blame. Right. Peter, when these guys come out with their YouTube video and they say, listen, there's no peace and Timoshenko's a sellout. We don't, we don't abide by all of this. Do the likes of Duque and Alvaro Uribe and others get vindicated in the eyes of the Colombian public, especially those who voted against the peace deal, because they say, you see, we cannot trust these guys. Well, you know, I think that it's, it's a very complex situation. Uh, but I think that making peace itself is always very, very difficult. Uh, lots of people in Colombia sort of have a deep-seated anger, hatred almost, for the FARC. They wanted them to be punished. They thought a war had been won, and they didn't have to offer all this kind of uh, generous conditions for a peace agreement. And there's still that kind of uh, uh, anger at the, at the FARC that, that, that—and at the same time, what I think was most helpful of your, your question uh, 
was the fact that the relations with the with the FARC and the guerrillas and the uh, illegal gangs, etc., in, in, in rural areas, has very much to do with the internal politics of Colombia itself. In other words, a lot of Duque's uh, reaction uh, to the statements, uh, to uh, relations with Venezuela, has to do not with uh, only the, the potential for uh, uh, reigniting a guerrilla war, but for the internal politics of the country seen broadly. Right. And I'm going to bring in the Venezuela angle. Um, a bit later on, I want to talk more about Maduro in a few moments, but I want to ask you, Sergio, if we, if we rewind and we look at Duque on the election trail and we look at him as he became the leader of Colombia and took over from, from Santos by emphasizing a different peace deal, one with more accountability, one with more justice, one where the FARC has to face up to its crimes, it doesn't just have community service and so on, that appealed to many people. Is this then inevitable? Because you have to throw out the, the peace baby with the bathwater if you want to get tougher. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right. To an extent, all peace agreements have opposition. All peace agreements also have spoiler actors. But Duque can't have the, the peace that he wants and sacrifice the rest of the peace that was signed. So if you look at the peace agreement, it has five major components, and bear with me. The first one is on rural reform. The second one is on political participation. The third one is on justice and victims' rights. The fourth one is on drugs. And then finally, uh, disarmament and demobilization. Well, Duque very much likes the disarmament and demobilization part of the agreement, but the other four, much less. And so he's, he's introduced measures uh, to the effect of reforming those parts, which haven't passed muster in Congress. And so if you just pick and choose what parts of an agreement signed by the state to implement, then, then you are, in effect, trying to throw uh, the baby with the bathwater. And that's not going to happen, though. Uh, Richard, as an outsider, when I was there a year ago, I, I found something that struck me was that there seemed to be two very different Colombias. There was the urban Colombia and the rural Colombia. And people had very different views about what they wanted or how they perceived or experienced the past few decades. So when they spoke about peace, they had different parameters. For people in the urban settings, it was, it was one thing. And people who lived in the rural areas, especially those places where FARC had a, an influence or an imprint, it was something fundamentally different. Is that part of the problem as well, that we're talking about two very different Colombias when we talk about peace? Um, it goes a bit further than just rural and uh, urban Colombia, because, of course, you've got a, sort of, let's say, young liberal uh, urban Colombia who are, of course, uh, in favor of peace. But if you take the referendum, for example, that, of course, uh, failed, uh, President Santos's referendum on the peace accords, the places that were most affected in the countryside, in the rural areas, by so many years of conflict were those who voted in favor of the peace accords. So, I mean, you have different regions and different areas voting uh, for distinct, distinct uh, you know, whether they want to the peace accord or whether they're against the peace accord. You'll have places like Antioquia, where the former president and now Senator Alvaro Uribe Vélez is from, voting almost blindly behind what he says. And of course, he's uh, very much, you know, against the peace deal. Right. And that's fascinating. Sergio Guzman, how much appetite is there among Colombians, if we were able to tell, um, to back Duque in being tough with these dissidents, whether they are the FARC splinter dissidents or ELN or others? Yeah, absolutely. If, if, if there are terrorist attacks or if there are activities by these groups that suggest, you know, we're, we're back in conflict uh, with, with these groups and it's going to affect civilians, sure, a lot of the population in Colombia will be like these, these individual members of the FARC uh, are now out of bounds. However, I think that there is great respect, both in the government and amongst the population, to the 90% of members of the FARC who did demobilize, who are concentrated in different zones and camps, and who are looking to have a better future for themselves and their families. So I think, uh, 
very much the individuals that abandoned the peace agreement by, by virtue of this announcement are, 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 are non grata in, in, in Colombia, but the individuals who are uh, reintegrating to society, uh, society is, is very much willing to stand up for them. Right. Peter Hakem, let's bring in the Venezuela angle now. So, Duque blaming Maduro, saying he's supporting these, quote, narco terrorists. Is Maduro fiddling? Is Maduro helping the dissidents and trying to destabilize Colombia? It's very hard to sort through the evidence on this. I think the, uh, there is movement of uh, armed forces, but, uh, armed uh, insurgents between Venezuela and Colombia. I think uh, Colombia provides something of an ideological tie to, to the, to the uh, uh, Colombian uh, uh, guerrillas. But on the whole, I think that uh, Colombia's problems go beyond the guerrillas. I mean, they involve, uh, uh, but there's lots of old grievances, old po uh, old battles. Mm -hmm. There's still a huge, you know, drug industry in Colombia. There's illegal mining in Colombia. Uh, there's a huge in in the rural areas illegal activity and poverty predominates. So I don't think that uh, much of the blame can be placed on Venezuela. I think this has been Colombia's problem for 50 years. It's still Colombia's problem. Certainly, it's made worse if, uh, you know, there's some support from Venezuela. But I don't right. think that should be seen as, a, as the central point. OK. And, and Sergio, this comes at an interesting time because The Wall Street Journal has documents which seems to suggest that the late ex- uh, Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez in the mid 2000s was attempt, attempting to sort of bombard the U.S. with cocaine, and he was he was working along with uh, with Colombian rebels in in doing so to unsettle the United States back then. Now we have the claim that even though Maduro's got all his problems in his country, he's still trying to unsettle the Colombians. Is this part of an internal dy dynamic where Duque has to demonize the other side, or does it check out? Is there something real here? No, I, I think it checks out. I think for a very long time we've all known that the regime that Chavez started and Maduro has continued is, is, is muddled in criminality, sometimes at the highest rank of the state and the military, who own the, the food distribution programs, control currency exchange, and to a large degree they have aided and abetted both the ELN and the FARC for, for a very long time. Whether or not they want to inundate the United States with cocaine, that's, that's an allegation that, that is unclear, whether they had the capacity to do so. But is Venezuela functioning very much as a, as a, as a narco state? Yes, I think that that checks out. Richard, is Venezuela making it worse in Colombia? Well, honestly, the, the border between Colombia and Venezuela has always been so porous, and the, the relationship between the neighboring countries is that of, you know, brothers or sisters. So it, it is a problem, isn't it? It is a problem with all of these huge migrations coming back and forwards, and, of course, the security that crossing a border for the ELN or the dissident FARCs can offer, uh, can, can, you know, can be offered by the Venezuelan state. It is a problem. It's a problem that Colombia doesn't need right now. Peter Hakem, would they be thinking about a plan B right now in Bogota, a plan for if this entire peace deal unravels? <laughs> Uh, I, I just don't know that. Uh, I presume some people are thinking about it. Uh, I think some people should be worrying about it. Uh, but by and large, I, I just don't see how this is going to go back to the pre-2016 era of, you know, a FARC force that could really uh, do considerable uh, con continuing damage. Uh, and be such a, a powerful force to sort of influence the, the flow of, of politics in Colombia as well. No, I, I don't see that. And uh, I think also you, one has to remember that the United States is very uh, focused on Venezuela at this point. And 
a lot of the pressure on Colombia to take a hard stand toward uh, Venezuela at this point comes, I think, from Washington. Mm. Sergio, is that true? Is that pressure coming from Washington? Whether, whether John Bolton is around or not, is the pressure still coming from Washington? Well, I was just going to mention that under, under new NSC Director O'Brien, uh, we, we, we still don't know what his position is on Venezuela, but we do know Trump was very hawkish um, on, on Venezuela and presented Trump with a number of options because um, uh, I believe the administration thought this was a low-hanging fruit and it turned out not to be um, as much. But the United States, is this is a much larger geopolitical game that is at play in Venezuela that both includes Russia and China and, and their interests in that country in the form of huge investments <laughs> and large debts. And so those countries are not going to, you know, let the United States and Colombia, uh, you know, have their way uh, on Venezuela. So this, this is a much more global issue. Right. Elliot Abrams, the Trump administration's special envoy to Venezuela, telling reporters... The regime in Caracas seems to be fomenting this kind of activity, in essence, turning over parts of the country, particularly to the ELN. So we, we have a clear idea of, of where this administration stands on, on this issue for now. Gentlemen, this is where I thank you all for your geopolitical analysis. Richard McCall, Sergio Guzman, and Peter Hakem, I thank you very much for joining us here on the Newsmakers. I want to take a slightly different angle now and bring in one more guest in San Salvador is Christian Visnes. He's the Norwegian Refugee Council's country director for Colombia and the surrounding region. Christian, I'm sure you, you listened in to the political debate of Colombia and also we touched on the issues with uh, Venezuela and the stuff on the border. As you look at the humanitarian situation, is your organization preparing for things to get worse? Yes, actually we, we are, and, 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 and that is, is striking in this uh, discussion, is the, is the difference between the political reality and, and the humanitarian reality, or the, the life that people are facing in those regions affected by conflict. If you go and ask people living in rural areas, particularly along the border to Venezuela or along the Pacific coast, as one of the worst areas, they would say they have seen no traces of the peace. I think the peace agreement is still alive, but, but, but for many people, their reality, their everyday life is armed conflict. They're living in the midst of an expanding now armed conflict. I saw you had the images uh, uh, from uh, ELN, uh, uh, and, and, and what we have seen uh, uh, th this, these years is that ELN has actually expanded uh, there uh, as, the, as it was the second biggest guerrilla, and now it's a guerrilla that is, is present uh, in many places. Okay, so we have these vacuums left behind in Colombia, right? When these are the places that the FARC once governed, places where other dissident groups had a presence, the government didn't have much of a presence, and Colombia's trying to figure out how to, how to fix this and how to make things better. And then to add to all of that along the border, you have Venezuela in economic turmoil, in political turmoil, and refugees flooding across the border. How much worse does it make the situation in those areas? It, it is a situation that feeds into each other, uh, basically. You had areas that were governed by the FARC, and they were demobilized. More than 90% are still committed to that. Those areas were not filled by government forces when they were demobilized and became, by that, uh, destabilized because the other groups moved in, splinter groups, new groups moved in. And then you had the have the situation on the Venezuela side where you have a country in deep crisis, which is also destabilized. So you have two countries, actually, uh, uh, de in, in a very destabilized region. And you see the conflict now filling and, and flowing into new areas where years before we hadn't seen. If you look at, for example, a number of internally displaced in Colombia, uh, since 2017, you see the number is slowly rising again. And we expect this year it to be more than 150,000 people internally displaced in Colombia, which is one of the measures of what is really going on in those areas affected by armed conflict. Can we technically uh, formally describe it as a refugee crisis? The, the Venezuela crisis you're referring Especially to Especially on the border with Colombia. 
Well, I think we both have an internally displaced crisis, and then we have a high number of people that are in need of what we call international protection, which should be then people that could access a refugee status. Not all of the people that that leave Venezuela, which is extremely high numbers, that between three to 5,000 people every day leave Venezuela and come into Colombia. Not all of them could be considered refugees, but clearly there are a number of them uh, that, that should be able to access refugee status. Uh, and are not. Most of them are considered migrants, vulnerable migrants, but we believe that a, a number of them should also be able to access refugee status, not only in Colombia, but uh, uh, around in the region where they are uh, choosing to go. Okay, Christian Visnes from the Norwegian Refugee Council. It was fascinating getting your perspective on the issue. I thank you very much for joining us. And of course, earlier on, Peter Hakem, Sergio Guzman, and Richard McCall. So, we're keeping a close eye on the situation in Colombia. I thank you very much for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Bye-bye. What's making it?